Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Lashkaripour, uh, and I'm a freshly minted PhD from uh, CIDR Lab at Boston University Department of Biomedical Engineering. And uh, today I want to talk about the research I've been doing over the past five years on machine learning based design automation of microfluidic flow focusing droplet generators. Um, so um, I've done my research in uh, CIDR Lab, which stands for Cross-Disciplinary Integration of Design Automation Research. Uh, and as you guessed it, we are uh, a diverse uh, background of engineers in biomedical, computer and electronic engineering and mechanical engineering. And the glue that holds us all together, uh, apart from our PI, Doug Densmore, is synthetic biology and uh, design automation. So synthetic biology in its uh, simplest form is where we uh, get inspired by uh, natural biofunctions and try to engineer them uh, to create either optimized or novel functionalities uh, that solve our bio-related problems. And uh, CRISPR technology is uh, a great example of uh, synthetic biology where Dr. Dodna and Dr. Charpentier were inspired by the uh, natural defense mechanisms of, uh, of bacteria against viruses to, to create this uh, technology for uh, gene editing, and they uh, received the Nobel Prize for it uh, uh, last year. Uh, it has uh, also many applications. For example, we can uh, uh, create microbes that produce uh, biodiesel in a very sustainable way. We can have uh, um, tailored uh, uh, crops that have additional uh, nutritional or medicinal value. We can, we can also uh, detect pathogens and contaminants early on in our uh, crops so we avoid uh, losing uh, uh, a lot of our crops. Um, we can have lab-grown meat. Uh, uh, we, we can have sustainable fashion in terms of uh, both the fabric itself and the fabric coloring, and even we can have uh, lab-grown meat. So uh, synthetic biology itself is a really uh, challenging field. We're trying to optimize and improve upon something uh, that life had 3.5 billion years to, to develop. So typically scientists go through the design, build, and test cycle. And because this is a challenging task, uh, this is a challenging task, uh, uh, tools can really accelerate this design, build, uh, test a cycle for synthetic biologists. And inside our lab, uh, we actually develop tools for, uh, uh, for design automation of these synthetic circuits. So you can have high level description of uh, what functionality you want uh, your synthetic circuit to carry out. And then uh, um, different candidates would be proposed by the tool uh, that you can later uh, assemble and test. We have tools like Puppeteer, that can provide instruction for assembling uh, these uh, synthetic circuits, either uh, with manual assembly or using automated liquid handling robots. And then finally, we are developing tools for uh, uh, microfluidic-based testing of these uh, synthetic circuits. And uh, my talk is gonna be uh, focused on the testing section. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, well, uh, over the past years, our ability to uh, sort of build more and more complex uh, uh, synthetic DNA has been uh, growing exponentially. And also uh, the cost of DNA synthesis and DNA uh, sequencing has been going down in the uh, past years. So testing uh, is now kind of a bottleneck where we can sort of build uh, these synthetic circuits faster um, faster than we can uh, test them. And you can see that in the re review papers uh, recently came out or uh, interviews with uh, major players in the field where uh, a good testing platform could uh, significantly accelerate, uh, uh, can significantly accelerate the discovery cycle in synthetic biology. So uh, droplet-based microfluidics, are uh, a great example or, or, or a great candidate for high throughput screening and high throughput testing in, uh, in synthetic biology where we can uh, uh, basically encapsulate cells inside our, uh, our picoliter and even nanoliter droplets. We can 
control the concentration uh, of our experiment in each of these droplets, we can add samples to droplets produced uh, already to, to sort of uh, mimic an assay. And then we can incub uh, incubate these droplets either on the chip or off the chip uh, for our assay to take place. Then uh, depending on our assay, uh, we can have a variety of different types of sensors. So here we are showing capacitive sensing and fluorescent sensing, uh, um, where, uh, where basically we can have a readout of how, where, how well our candidate has uh, sort of carried out that assay. Um, and then finally, uh, depending on our readouts, we can uh, sort the droplets that uh, behaved uh, in an interesting way or in a desirable way uh, to sort of uh, see or fish out uh, those conduct circuits that uh, gave rise to that uh, interesting behavior. So with that, you would expect uh, sort of uh, most synthetic biology labs to be just filled with high throughput screening platforms, just running nonstop, uh, doing, these, uh, doing these sort of screens to see what candidates work the best. However, we see that's really uh, an exception rather than being the norm. And um, we, we can sort of contribute several reasons for it. Uh, one part is fabricating these uh, microflake devices uh, are expensive. They require uh, a good amount of uh, expertise uh, and experience. And also they require some uh, facilities or infrastructure like a clean room facility. Um, and even if you want to have integrated electrodes in them, your, your, your fabrication becomes even more challenging and more uh, expensive. Uh, we, we don't know a lot about the fluid dynamics of microflu microfluidics, specifically multiphase flows uh, or droplet-based microfluidics. Uh, so, so we don't understand the fluid dynamics uh, that well. And also, there's not a lot of characterization data uh, sort of out there in the literature and people mostly publish on uh, sort of the one optimized device that works and uh, leave out uh, sort of lots of characterization data. So um, in, in your typical microfluidic device, if you wanna sort of like swap out your fluids, the type of cells you use, or even if uh, you just uh, change your surfactant, your microfluidic device might not work uh, sort of optimally or might stop working uh, altogether. And uh, also, we don't have any uh, sort of microfluidic specific uh, design tool or design automation tools. For example, here uh, on the figure on the bottom right, you are seeing a microfluidic device with more than 4,000 components on it, and all of them has been uh, uh, manually uh, drawn. Um, and sort of all of these together make uh, fabricating microfluidic device to be an iterative, costly, and time-consuming process with um, if you want to fabricate it in-house, it's, uh, it's going to be a little bit more than $200 to $500, uh, um, and it could take days. If you want to order it or outsource it, uh, then these uh, numbers would uh, rise e even higher. So um, our goal was to uh, address uh, a part of this by uh, developing a software tool for uh, design automation of droplet generators, specifically flow focusing droplet generators. So the idea is uh, a user can go to our software or our website and uh, specify a desired droplet diameter and a generation rate. And then we'll use some uh, machine learning algorithms uh, on the back end to uh, sort of suggest a geometry and also the flow rates the user needs to run that device at to achieve their desired performance in terms of uh, the droplet diameter and generation rate. So to achieve design automation, the first, uh, the first step is to, uh, to sort of develop performance prediction, meaning that if we have our design parameters, including our geometry and flow condition, uh, we want to be able to predict the droplet size and uh, generation rate. Um, as, we, as we talked about it before, uh, the fluid dynamics of droplet-based uh, microfluidic devices is complex, and neural networks are ideal tools for uh, sort of understanding and having uh, sort of like a predictive model of complex phenomena. And here, so we want to develop a neural network that can take all the six geometric parameters of flow focusing device and the two flow condition parameters and then be able to uh, 
predict the droplet diameter and the generation rate. So the one downside to neural networks is uh, it requires a lot of data. And as we talked about it, uh, fabricating my fixed devices traditionally is an expensive uh, procedure. So it's not really uh, 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 data generation friendly. So um, we developed this uh, a sort of low cost uh, rapid prototyping for microfluidics where we uh, take advantage of a new class of CNC mills that cost less than $3,000 uh, and, and then mill microfluidic uh, geometries out of thermoplastics, specifically uh, polycarbonate here. And then we can use uh, sort of uh, an elastic membrane in, in between with clamps or use uh, double-sided adhesives or even chemical bonding uh, to sort of seal our, our microfluidic devices. And with this method, we can fabricate microfluidic devices with features as small as 75 micron. Um, also, they would cost uh, less than $10 each and uh, it requires less than two hours to fabricate a device. So now that we have a low-cost rapid prototyping method, on hand, we can go about our challenge uh, of creating uh, lots of data. So uh, we, we took a, a microfluidic uh, flow focusing geometry and created large variations uh, of the geometry, changed all the geometric parameters and fabricated close to uh, 45 different flow focusing devices. And then each of those devices we would test at a, a wide range of capillary numbers and flow rate ratio to to sort of create this uh, large scale data set. So how does our, our, our data set look? Well, uh, we, we have close to uh, a thousand total uh, data points with almost uh, approximately equal number of data points in the dripping and uh, the jetting regime, as you can see um, on the figure on the bottom uh, left. So we have our data set now. Uh, um, now uh, the question needs to be asked, well, how will do uh, machine learning models uh, uh, predict the performance of flow focusing devices? Um, so here on the graphs, what you are looking at uh, on the X axis is gonna be the observed performance and on the Y axis is gonna be uh, the predicted performance. So drop the diameter or generation. Rate. And in an ideal scenario, uh, we want all of these dots to sort of like line up on the Y equals X uh, line and you can see uh, our neural networks are doing a really good job of uh, predicting the performance of slow focusing devices. An observation can be made that we can predict uh, drop of diameter with a higher accuracy in comparison to uh, generation rate. So to give you an idea of how well uh, these models are predicting uh, the performance of slow focusing devices, uh, uh, we, we have this comparison of the previously proposed scaling laws. Uh, for flow focusing geometries. And you can see uh, uh, in, in drought for predicting droplet diameter, they're not as accurate. And in the generation rate, there's, uh, there's really uh, not a lot of accurate performance prediction going on at all on, for the scaling laws. And in scaling laws defense, they're not really meant for accurate performance prediction. They're meant for understanding the high level dynamics of system. And the only reason we're comparing them right now is because of the lack of any other sort of tool to compare it to. And um, now that we have performance prediction, we actually made it into a software and also uh, an, an online website. So you can actually go to our website, daftycat.org, uh, and you can sort of input uh, the, the device parameters uh, of your flow focusing geometry, and we're able to predict how well uh, we were able to predict the droplet diameter and the generation rate. Um, on average, we saw uh, a mean absolute error of less than 10 microns uh, for predicting the diameter and less than 20 hertz for uh, predicting the generation rate. So um, now that we have uh, accurate performance prediction, um, now that we have accurate performance prediction on hand, uh, now it's time to sort of like tackle the main challenge uh, we, we, we sort of wanted to solve, which was design automation where a user provides their desired droplet diameter and generation rate, and we're able to uh, suggest the design that delivers that performance. So to, to achieve this uh, design automation, we actually uh, came up with a relatively uh, award algorithm where uh, when a user specifies their desired uh, performance, we look through our data set and then find a data point um, 
in there that has the closest performance uh, uh, to the desired uh, uh, performance specified by the user. Each device has eight different parameters. So we're going to tweak those parameters a little bit each by increasing and decreasing them by uh, normalized and equal steps, creating 16 new designs. Then we use our uh, neural networks to predict the performance of all of these newly generated designs. And the one that got us closest to the desired performance will be uh, sort of taken as the starting point for our second iteration. So we'll continue this process until our neural networks are able to sort of find a design uh, that accurately uh, uh, sort of um, delivers the desired performance. So how well uh, does it work? Um, so uh, at the first step to uh, sort of test this, uh, we use our software to specify uh, just droplet diameter, uh, ranging from droplet sizes of 25 microns all the way up to 200 microns. And then we fabricated and tested the device that was suggested by the software. And as you can see uh, on the figure, uh, where we're keeping a really good trend of, uh, of delivering the droplet diameter uh, that was specified by the user. Um, in addition, you can also specify droplet diameter and generation rate at the same time. So uh, for these graphs, we are specifying a droplet diameter of 100 microns and a generation rate uh, ranging from uh, 50 droplets per second all the way up to uh, 500 droplets per uh, second. And uh, well, we can uh, do the same thing for a droplet diameter of 75 microns, the same generation rate, and droplet diameter of 50 microns uh, with the same generation rate. And sort of to, uh, to summarize these in numbers, on average, uh, we observed an experimental error of around 5% for uh, for the for the droplet diameter and around 10% for the generation rate. So if a user specifies the droplet diameter and generation rate, we're able to deliver that performance uh, uh, with an average error of 5% and 10% uh, for drop diameter and uh, generation rate, uh, respectively. So uh, we made this also into a software where you can go to our website and specify your uh, desired uh, diameter and generation rate and hit generation, uh, hit generate design. And you can see uh, you get your uh, geometry. You can also open that design in a software created in our lab called 3 and then download that design uh, in a format uh, of SVG files that you can directly load to the software that controls the CNC mill. Um, now, you have to fill around with the settings a little bit just to make sure your G codes uh, are placed correctly. But then uh, you can rapidly prototype that uh, microplate device and assemble it, um, as you can see here. And, and then uh, that device would deliver that desired performance. So here we wanted 50 hertz and 150 microns and 150 hertz. And as you can see, we're getting really close to that. You can also have some design constraints, for example, for single cell encapsulation. We want uh, our device to be as shallow as possible. Uh, so here we're doing an aspect ratio of one, which is the minimum in our software to keep the cells in the, uh, in the sort of the plane of focus. You can see an entirely new design is suggested for the same performance. It can also give you the cell concentration you need to run your experiment at. And you can see uh, we're getting single cell encapsulation. And also we're getting droplet diameters of 46.3 microns and 167 hertz. Uh, which is uh, uh, basically really close to our, our desired performance. So we can have uh, design automation with or without constraints. It is an online tool, and also, um, and also uh, it, we can sort of calculate the, uh, the cell concentrations you need to uh, run your experiments at to achieve uh, single cell encapsulation. So, um, when you use our software and specify your desired uh, performance, uh, a design will be suggested to you. And uh, the, the sort of the performance you're going to get out of that device is going to be ultimately dependent on the tolerances in your fabrication and also testing, meaning how accurate your pumps are. And using our neural networks, we're actually able to predict how these tolerances would affect your uh, observed performance. Uh, for example, here we're assuming your tolerance, uh, your fabrication has about 10% error in 
uh, and sort of spatial accuracy. So, so we can predict how having an oil inlet width 10% larger or smaller would affect your uh, observed uh, droplet diameter. We can also do this uh, sort of very efficiently for uh, all of the other design parameters uh, for both droplet diameter and generation rate uh, and creating these sort of like tolerance plots uh, um, that you can use to, to understand how tolerance to the fabrication uh, will affect your uh, observed performance. We can also use these uh, information provided here to identify what are the main parameters you have to care about or make sure you're doing accurately to achieve that, uh, to achieve that desired performance. For example, in, in the case that we are showing here, for droplet diameter, your oil inlet width is the most dominant parameter. So once you fabricate your device, you just want to make sure to look at the uh, device under the microscope, make sure your oil inlet width is what we are uh, suggesting, uh, and then you should be uh, good to go. Uh, another observation that can be made here is um, these dominant parameters will change based on what is your design and what is your desired per performance. So it's not going to be always take a look at the oil inlet width, sometimes it's going to be the orifice or other parameters and that goes to show like uh, the, the the sort of the the level of uh, sophistication a design automation tool like this can bring that gives you performance specific uh, information on your device and how you should fabricate it um, and then ultimately we can also use our uh, neural networks to predict how changing the flow rates uh, uh, increasing uh, both the flow rate of oil and water would affect your droplet diameter and generation rate. So in case if you have tolerances in your fabrication, you can use these plots as for um, um, as guidelines to bring the, per, the observed performance back uh, to your desired performance. So all of this is great, but well, how generalizable is it? So traditionally, uh, or, or with traditional machine learning, um, let's say Say we, we required 500 data points to develop an accurate neural network that can predict the performance of droplet generation. And if you want to change your oil or if you want to change uh, your fluid from one type to another, one would expect you would need another 500 data points uh, to sort of uh, achieve the same level of uh, performance accuracy. However, with, uh, with transfer learning, uh, um, um, since the high-level dynamics of droplet generation would stay the same, uh, regardless of the types of fluids you can use, uh, we can do the generalizability from one fluid to another much more efficiently. Uh, and uh, if we have um, a, a model already trained on droplet generation, then we can generalize that uh, with significantly fewer number of data points to, uh, to, to new fluids. And you can think about it. Uh, uh, as this way, it would be much easier to understand or to learn how to uh, ride a motorcycle if you already know how to uh, ride a bike. And the way uh, uh, transfer learning uh, itself works is actually uh, pretty simple. So assume a typical feed-forward uh, neural network. Um, and what's generally agreed upon is the first few hidden layers carry the more generic information system so this is going to be if your neural network is like a classifier for uh, like cats versus dog or is it a model for predicting the performance of droplet generation and the last few hidden layers uh, carry more specific information so this could be about your fluid properties or the, uh, the sort of the material properties used for uh, your microplate devices to create these droplets so in transfer learning what we do is we don't allow the first few hidden layers to be updated when we are training our model. So we just keep, the, keep those layers as frozen layers and just allow the last couple of hidden layers to be updated to our new system. And because we don't really require to train uh, for so many uh, additional weights now, we only need a few weights to be updated uh, in our neural network. This requires uh, much, uh, much fewer uh, data points. So, to see if actually transfer learning uh, works in droplet microflakes, what we did is, uh, if you remember, we had a large scale data set on, on generating droplets using GI water and NF350 mineral oil. 
So uh, to test the applicability of transfer learning and droplet generation, we created two new uh, small scale data sets. The first one, we swapped out DLI water for LV bacterial media and produced droplets with LV bacterial media, creating about 36 data points. And then in our second small scale data set, we changed the oil from NF350 mineral oil to light mineral oil. And the viscosity difference between these two oils uh, is uh, actually a factor of two. So these oils are uh, significantly uh, different uh, in, in their fluid properties. And as you can see, when training neural networks from scratch, our models are not really doing a good job on, uh, on accurately predicting the performance for these small scale data sets. And that's sort of given because nobody's expecting uh, neural networks to uh, work uh, good with uh, only having like 40 or 20 data points. However, when we use transfer learning and update our pre-trained models with this uh, new small scale data set, we can see uh, our models are doing a much, much better job in comparison to training from scratch when using uh, transfer learning. So uh, we have done uh, sort of the heavy lifting on understanding or capturing the high level dynamics of droplet generation with a large scale data set. And now uh, us or, uh, or different users can create these small scale data sets of let's say 40, 50, or, or something around that data point to uh, sort of generalize this uh, and update our models to, to sort of uh, be able to predict the performance of droplet generators for uh, different types of fluids. So everything we talked about today uh, was about a single component in a single type of, uh, um, uh, in a single type of microplay. So we're doing uh, design automation for specifically flow focusing droplet generators and uh, there are so many different components in just droplet microfluidics itself. And also there are so many different kinds of microfluidics like inertial microfluidics, acoustic microfluidics, or uh, capillary microfluidics. So uh, this cannot be done by a single person, single lab, or even a single institution. And it really requires a sort of a community uh, of people sort of to uh, start working together to share data and also create open source uh, tools like, uh, like DASE. Um, that can uh, sort of uh, really accelerate the, uh, the the sort of the design process in microfluidics and then enable uh, sort of downstream processes like synthetic biology that we talked about earlier that could really benefit uh, from uh, not having to spend too much time on developing uh, microfluidic devices. So towards this end, uh, we made sure all of our software is open source and also all of the data we created can be uh, freely accessed and downloaded on our website. So uh, make sure to check out our website, uh, our lab website, cytolab.org, our tool website, daftycat.org. And if you're interested to see uh, sort of our source code, you can go to our uh, GitHub as well. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank my PI, Dr. Doug Densmore, my great colleagues at Cider Lab and Damp Lab, uh, and also uh, man, my, my, my funding uh, uh, sort of agencies. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank you all for your time and attention.